welcome to Confetti All Around, a podcast hosted by Rooted in Reflection. I am Cynthia Perez, the host of Confetti All Around, and I am so excited to have with us today professional Boricua genealogist, Iris Neri Alicea Flores. Thank you so much for being here with us today. You're welcome. I'm so excited. <laughs> yes, I want to get in. We're going to get into all of her cuentos, but I want to let you know how I found Iris Neri. It was not only the ancestors, but mm -hmm. I really feel like it's a time where we are connected. Um, I found you on a friend's live, Bienestar CCC, um, yeah. with Ali, right? And you just blew me away, Iris Neri. Not only the way you you present the the information that we're that you're going to tell us about but it's mm -hmm. you have like this glow about you that is really rooted in i can tell wow. you are on a mission i can tell that you are really led in a different way of like you're not just data and research i can tell that it's it's really um some spirit work too so please um i found you at your ig descubre tu historia and so please tell us what it means to be a professional genealogist and how you got into this work. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, wow. So um, I've always had a love for history. That's one thing. Like, uh, it's funny. I always said when one thing I always said as a kid, when I see something that interests me or that I love, I see colors. So for me, history was like, I see colors. I see shining colors. I, cause I love it so much. But when I went to college, <laughs> I went the other route. I went the, you know, well, I need it. I should be able to find work, blah, blah, blah. So the I practical went to human, route. the practical route. Exactly. So I actually went to human resources and that's what I did for almost 20 years. But that love for history. I mean, that's all I own is history books. I don't own one HR business book. <laughs> You couldn't pay me to sit down and read a book. Oh. <laughs> and, but, oh God, I, 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 I own textbooks. And then obviously the love for the family history, listening to my abuelo and abuela, uh, my maternal grandparents and their stories about Puerto Rico growing up in the thirties and forties and then the fifties when they came to the United States. And it was just, I wanted to know more. I wanted, there was also that yearning of, it was so, I see it as a different roads. There's the personal road where I needed to find answers to why certain things happen in my life, especially mm -hmm. when it came to my paternal side and not knowing my paternal grandmother or my paternal grandparents, both of them, while I was so close to my maternal grandparents and I knew my great grandparents from that side. So it was all these things. And then there was the, the road as a Puerto Rican as understanding more about Puerto Rico and its history as to what happened, why, yeah. why yeah. things are the way they are. Oh, the, already I'm getting emotional. Why I want to be home, but I can't be home. Oh, that's what we talked about on that call, that yearning. Yep. That big yearning. And where does it come from? Certain instinctive things that I also knew as a child that I didn't understand where they came from or why. And I wanted to just find those answers. And, and then as I found those answers, I realized how, what it was doing for me as a, as a, as, as a daughter, as a mother, as a wife, and then as a Puerto Rican, as a Latina living here too, in the diaspora away from my country, away from my people. I'm like, more Latinos need this. We need this. This is important for us as a collective. And that is where my mission for the Cure Tu Historia grew. And I started it and I found it 2019. <laughs> so when I, and then left my full time in 2021. It sounds like it was aligned with the timing. It was aligned with your story because I wonder if you could have like dipped into this maybe even a few years before and been like, okay, but it sounds like it was really something that was like, everything kind of happened at the right time. Yes. For you. Yeah. I mean, it was all these things started to come together. So Maria happened in Puerto Rico and yeah. it was one of the most painful anxiety driven weeks for us here in the diaspora, you know, not being able to connect to our, our families not being able to know what's happening, seeing all these horrible videos. So like not knowing what's happening in the, in La Isla, 
And I saw how all of us came together. And I, for a very long time, for a lot of years, I kind of disconnected myself a little bit from the community um, because of that that we're not knowing where I belong, not feeling mm-hmm. Latina enough, not feel, but feel or not feel, you know, just didn't know where to fit. It's kind of just, yeah. Hiding right. So I was in my own little box. And so I decided to find a job in a, in this higher, in higher ed here where my community is. I said, you know what? I need to get back in with my community and I found that passion for my community. I saw how we all came together. That whether we're Boricuas from here, Boricuas from there, where we're born there, didn't matter anymore. And I saw that and inspired me to just reconnect. Um, and so because for me, it was very traumatic to move from Puerto Rico here. It was a lot of conflicts. Tell us, and about what age did you move from Puerto Rico to here? I think you had mentioned. I moved, so I moved when I was eight. But okay. I was always, I still, it was, it was traumatic. I mean, for me, because I still remember six years old. It is a very vivid memory. We're on a ride in Puerto Rico because we used to go, my dad would take us on rides. And I remember looking at this field, beautiful field with palm trees, el campo en Puerto Rico, and saying to myself, si me voy, yo vuelvo. I was six mm-hmm. years old. So when I leave at eight, I did, I left thinking it was an adventure. <laughs> it didn't dawn on me. I'm not coming back. So, Cause the idea of live, leaving Puerto Rico was just not an idea. So, you know, my parents of course did the best they could to understand, but at eight, you don't know really what the impact of things. So And of course, I'm all excited to see what is it like over here, the chimneys. I still remember getting out of the car. That's what you're excited about? (laughs) I was a big Mary Poppins fan. Oh, you're like, oh, I know what to do. I know what to do. Even though it's not London, right? But it's all the same. It's not Puerto Rico. Is that it? We're looking at the houses. Oh, there's a chimney. (laughs) I love it. So when my life started here and then I'm like, I enrolled in school. I didn't know the language. I was bullied. So those were my first experiences. And then realizing, oh, wait, I'm not going back. Yeah. So I always struggle a lot with feeling like this is home. That grief, too. Uh, You know what I saw when you said the age of eight? Like, wow. Could you, I mean, you don't have to imagine this is you, but like I was imagining you at eight already having eight years in la tierra of Puerto Rico, you know, Puerto Rico. And I've been to Puerto Rico two times. I went for my honeymoon. I went for college. It's, it's so beautiful. So uh-huh. I can't imagine knowing that land. I, I, when I think of it, I mean like knowing what the dirt feels like between your toes, knowing what the mangoes are like juicy in the summer, you know, like there's just certain things that are your home. But yes. when you're a kid, you're so like, you're so part of the land. Like I have goosebumps thinking of you. Yes. So it's like pulling a tree from its, from its home, its roots yes. and then planting oh. it in U- the United States, which is so different from Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. It, it really is magical. So, wow. And in a way too, like, you know, it's a home of, of someone's choosing, but not your choosing. And I really wonder, like you are like an ancestor, you know, that is coming here. And it's like, I want to be there. (laughs) And, you know, my (laughs) next question for you, because I loved your bio, um, you will see it in the show notes, but just your bio that you shared about how this was a journey as a child. And I pictured you helping your, your, um, your, your dad's side find their, their roots. So I want to ask you, can you paint the picture of what your childhood was like growing up? What sounds and smells were typical in your Um. home? What, family members were active in your childhood, you know, in Puerto Rico before you came here. Tell okay. So bit. yeah, Puerto Rico. Oh, in Puerto Rico, I, it was freedom. It was, I was always outside with, I was the little girl always visiting all the neighbors and sitting with the older neighbor, elder neighbors. <laughs> I was always doing that. I was always go to all of the neighbors and I would sit with them and talk to them as a very little girl, just a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of adults around me, laughter, but the air being outside that freedom is, it was a sense of freedom. 
um, always having an elder. I mean, it was always, you know, I would go to my abuela, abuela, abuela and abuela's house. And it was just amazing just to sit there and be with them. Then if I wanted to go, I ha my, my grand, my dad, um, my abuela Edie's, uh, she brought, she was, she raised him after his biological mother passed. Um, and that's who I'm named after. I was so, just going to ask you that. Okay. Edie. Yeah. And she was a teacher and she would bring me, you know, she would bring me to her school and sit me down just to show me off as her granddaughter. And it was just a lot of family. I remember a lot of family being always surrounded by family, music, smells of the food, even from outside. Like frying, maybe like the popping of the frying. Yes. <laughs> we were talking about this before that, you know, my family's from Yucatan. So we share similar, you know, I, I think of my family's more Caribbean than traditional Mexicanos. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we like amacas, you know, we rest in amacas, yeah. we like plantains, we are citrus, we have so many different fruits that are, you know, pitaya is like a, a national fruit there. So it's very similar things, but like the frying in the morning, of, yeah. of tostones or, you know, platano frito. So just like, I can imagine you just running around, just all that chatter. And yeah, like you said, like when you talk about the land, your face like glows, you know? So how beautiful that you're helping people connect with roots that contain stories like yours, that contain like the magic of the land. Um, so you're a kid and you're, you're really close with your grandparents. You know, you were saying you always hang out with the older people. I can imagine that you heard a lot of good stories. Yes. So how, <laughs> were you like the little kid, like just hanging out by the adults, trying to listen to their stories and, and oh, gathering yeah. data? And would get in trouble probably. Y estas conversaciones de adulto. <laughs> I would hear that a lot <laughs> because I was always there listening. I just always enjoyed it. Like I remember we lived in this street and the last house we lived in before we moved here, it's this street where my mom grew up, where my maternal grandparents lived for many years and you know the neighbors there they all knew each other like I could I can picture and I could tell you where who lived in each house right in that whole street Beautiful. and I was always in one of those houses always uh it, they were me, I mean, a lot of them, unfortunately, you know, they're getting older they were my around my grandparents ages or a little older so some of them have passed by now but it was just a beautiful time. And now I, I now I appreciate it more. Now I see all I these adults that kind of like cocooned me. You know, sometimes at home things were, you know, um, not, the, not, were hard. Sometimes it was hard and they cocooned me and they made me feel safe. And it was an amazing time and I always appreciate and I just have so much love for them. Yeah, beautiful. And I just picture you like really just uh, gathering data all the time, like a yes. and taking it back to your little trove, at, you know, como una niña, like, okay, what did I learn from today? What did I gather? And taking it back. Little did they know that you would use this, this skill of yours to be in mm -hmm. spaces where these big stories are happening or to be in spaces where maybe some kids don't care what those viejitos are talking about, but you do. I did. And I, I really was feel like that's your spirit seven. work. Yeah, yeah was, you were there. Six or seven, and I was, that's who I hung out with. Yeah. Um, so what, so how did you go from these little stories to having your family trust you to like do this genealogy work, this like amateur genealogy work first? How did this come about? I want to hear the cuento behind it. Whatever you want to share oh, with us. Wow. So when I first started, it was 10 years ago. Um, at first, my mom was always very supportive. Like my mom wants to know more. You know, she has so many questions herself about what she grew up around and the people around her. So my mom was all for it. She's always like the one, you know, like in my, my dad, he actually, my love for history was influenced. It was because of my dad. My dad has always loved histories and that was his favorite subject in school and mine too. So it was through, he influenced that a lot, but I noticed when it came to speaking about his family, there was a lot of hurt, mm. a lot of pain. Um, it came through in not sometimes the healthiest ways. 
I didn't know a lot about his mother outside of she passed when he was 10. And my dad's very emotional and gets very attached to certain things. And I noticed as a little kid, him having this shoe box, shoe shining box. And it's pretty big. And he, but it goes everywhere he is. And he keeps it. I mean, can't, I see, I remember seeing in Puerto Rico when we lived in Puerto Rico. It's, I know exactly where it is in his closet right now. <laughs> that's where he keeps his special things. And it's, that's his connection to his mom. That's his connect because he would take La Lancha de Cataño, the ferry, and to San Juan at six years old and would use the money from shoe shining to buy her medicines. But I always heard so much pain and he wouldn't talk about her a lot. That's all I knew and her name. And I wanted, and I'm so inspired by, in many ways, by the women in my family. And this is the one woman that I'm always wondered, well, what, what, what would it have been like? I know her name is Faustina, but I don't know. Is she Abuela Faustina? She didn't feel like Abuela Faustina. I didn't feel that connection. And she's the one that, she was the what, the one that I said, finally, I'm going to start. At first, it was more like, hey, dad, I'm going to do this. <laughs> At first, and he was like, okay. I could see the hesitancy in his mind and his in his voice. But once I started, he started to ask questions. And I started to hear so many more stories about her. Uh, the hard ones. So there were mm -hmm. hard, you know, there were the hard ones. Uh, she did suffer from domestic abuse. But there was also... The, the, the little things like, or not the little things, her big heart, you know, how she took one day a, a homeless man and asked her if he could sleep in her in, in el balcón in Puerto Rico, in, a balcón at least for that night. And she allowed him and allowed him to do that. So he could at least in Puerto Rico, los balcones are, you know, a little, yeah, like an extension of the house. So it was, and how, her cooking, he says that she always cooks so good. And apparently I make rice like she does and I didn't even know it. Uh -huh. So that in Puerto Rico, you either, so the way we make our rice, there's two, either people put the oil, the rice, and then the water. Yeah. Others put the water, the, and the, the oil, the water, and then the rice. I, I didn't yeah. know that. I do it the first way. Uh, the, the, pegadito, the, pegadito. You like the little, pegado, 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 pegadito, <laughs> yeah. I did never need, I instinctively just started to do it that way. And my mom tapped was the into one that, that code. Yeah. And it was just that, I don't know, just knowing that one connection and knowing, oh, wow, yo hago eso como abuela. I'm 4'10". I'm the only one in my family outside of my paternal aunt who is 4'10". And then I find out abuela was 4'10". So we're tiny. Mm. And I'm like, okay, that's another thing. Another, okay, so... And I just got so curious and I wanted to know. And through her, she became real. Tell she me what else you found out life. about her. I want to know what, like, was there a, something that just, was there a, okay, for, wait, what I wrote is I could see you, like, I could see your dad wanting you to do this, but not knowing how to feel like a lot of feelings, like what will she yes. find? I don't know, but I can, I can imagine as a parent, like your child being an adult now and offering you this gift that you would have never imagined you needed, that you would have never even asked for. And then they say, they're mm -hmm. going to do it. Don't worry about it. Just tell me stories. And then I wanted to know, like, did you find more memories coming up within him as you pull? Like, yes. did you find that he was able to unblock things? And also was he getting more like, Oh, and another thing, like, was he getting all roped in? Tell me. Absolutely. Oh yeah. He would, uh, so many stories started to come in. Um, okay. about her, about her, the little things he remembered, obviously he was 10. Um, and so he was just, it, it, then it's just started to blow up a little bit. I started to share pictures that I had found of a half sister that he didn't know existed. Wow. From his mom's and side or his dad's side? From his, for him, from his mom's side. Okay. So, and for me and for him specifically, it was so, I can't imagine for him because it was for impactful for me because looking at a picture of his half sister, of her half sister. So I did get to meet her full sister, her full sibling uh, when I was a girl, a little girl, but th 
things were so disconnected. I didn't even realize she was my grandmother's sister. So it was later yeah. as an adult that I'm like, wait, Titi Hilda is what? Wait. <laughs> so you're like, I could, re, yeah. Yeah. I was able to reconfigure these relationships because I never even knew that yeah. I had been around her family. You know what's wild is you know you were in your your grandmother's womb. You were a little webito. Yeah. You were a DNA cell in her webitos. And like I just are I just wonder like how much of her is you, right? Like how many um, children did she have total? Do you know? Seven. Seven children. And seven children. Um, how many children did your dad have? Five. Well, no, six. There are five biological, and then we, my parents adopted my nephew. So okay. we're six. Yeah, I picture you like holding space for your dad in this like motherly kind of way. Um, so as you started to do this, what were there like ancestral messages, like in you know in, instincts, kind of like how when you cook, were there uh, were there big and small messages that were coming into you that is more than just like this thing you want to do with your dad, like this bigger knowing that this is what you meant, you're meant to do. Yeah, it, um, it was a lot of um, a lot of uh, oh my god, it was just with a lot of dates. It started with dates. And I, and I think I posted a video because it happens a lot. Um, when I, I think, I don't know if that's the ancestors way of saying, yup. Okay. Yes. This is how you, it's their little granitos de arroz to let me know you're on. Yes. This is where you need to go. So it would always happen where I would be working on something on her, on a document specifically for her. And it turns out that it's, I'm close to her birthday or it is her birth date. It started with her. And how did I instinctively just started finding this document right on her birthday on a random day that happened to be her birthday? Wow. And that you're aware to find it. You're not just like shuffling through it. You're just no. like, boom, focus. Exactly. So it, it happened with my grandfather, her husband. Um, and because my grandfather passed when I was six and he wasn't a big part of my life before that. So I don't really have a lot of memories of him. And it happened with him. Um, and so just little th things like that and seeing it, just feel that instinct of knowing, okay, wait, this is, I need to go this way. So last week I had not touched my, my family tree in, mm -hmm. in a long time because I'm so busy working on other people's family trees. <laughs> right. Right. So I had, I, there was this brick wall I've been sitting on for the Aliseas, my dad's side for years now. And something said, I felt this pull go, go work on the family tree. It's 1130 at night. I should have been shutting everything off. I broke through the wall. And the document that helped me break through that wall was the same date as the, the, the day I was working on. Mm, wow. That I found that the Aliseas are pardos libres, which is something I've always felt that 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 connection exactly. came from that side. Um, free, so these are Pardos Libres are most likely people that were at some formerly enslaved. Oh, wow. And they wanted knowing, you to know that. Yes. Yes. Just confirming that I've always had that feeling. I mean, yes, I know it comes from different lines in, in both sides, but I knew something. So I'm like, I felt the Aliseas was something closer and there was something more there. And, and when I saw that, I was like, I knew it. Wow. I, and then it happened on, yeah, the document was February 27th and I was working that same day. And so you and, find this document confirming this. What do you do? Like, first of all, how do you process this? And then what do you, <laughs> like, how do you pick up these nuggets and how do you know, like, do you, okay. I, I was thinking of so many questions today as I was like, <laughs> I really wanted to set my intention to talk to you and like, just, you know, I, I know I told you a little bit of what I wanted to, but I was really like, let me just let the questions come. Yeah. But something for you, I wanted to ask you, how often do you have to step aside from this work? Like you said, step, go do something else and let the, 
the intuition, let the messages come to you on what you need to do next. Like how much of this is you knowing what to look for and how much of this is just letting the pieces come to you? I think it's a bit of both. It's definitely half, half because there are points where it's funny. I I'll be looking at somebody's and I'm hitting, I'm just not, I can't, I just don't see it. And I feel it's like, I feel like that it's time to tap out, tap out. It's time to walk away. And I, every single time I have walked away and I take that moment, it's like this download of all of a sudden strategies come in and I sit down and boom, I find a way or I find an answer or I find a strategy. And, and it's things that, I mean, it's instinct, instinct, because I don't know how it's coming. I mean, it, I mean, I'm looking at you. Can I just say like, just, this is, this is like the work I talk about and I feel like you're saying something and I'd love to put like some science behind it because I right. think you're saying three <laughs> things. I think that you're spirit led, which I've told you, like, I think Absolutely. Yeah, it is I your, do. your, it's like when you sit there to do it, you're like the portal of where do you need to go? You know, your, your portal is like a little, uh, librarian filing cabinet of like, Hmm. But I also think that you took the time to take a break, which is our body just saying, hey, take a break. So when you took a break, you can like access all of your thoughts, creativity. Okay, what else? So you're not stressed out. And then I think mm -hmm. the other part of like you said, you're like tapping into that instinct. You know, you just sit there and let it just kind of work through you of just the codes that are in you. Yeah. Wow. So I can see how this work, it's not just like something you did, something you're offering, it's big, huge, profound work. I could see how it's hard to walk away from. It is. It is. I'm always, I, I just can't stop. And then I feel the nudge of you have to go, you got to get on, you got to get on. Um, I like every single case I have at that moment, they're my family. I bet they're called to you. And I wanted to add, okay, good. I wanted to get into what does it look like to work with you? What does it look like? I mean, I've been doing epigenetic work for the last two years. Fascinada, fascinada. That's why we, we talk and we'll get into that. But what does it look like for someone like me to hire a genealogist, to work with a genealogist? What could I mm -hmm. expect? And what am I even looking for? What's the point of this? Walk me through it, please. Oh, wow. That's the, I think that's the big a, one. <laughs> That's a big one, yeah. Because <laughs> I think it, there's all kinds of different reasons why people come to me. Okay. I think the most common, I well, I think the most uh, common is my family won't speak about it or I've never been told information and I've always wanted to know. I want to know who I am. I want to know where I come from. And uh, that is, the I think, one of the most common and look, you come to, yeah, you come to me, we talk. Normally I talk to them for like 30 minutes, a good th or more. <laughs> um, and just get a good idea of who they are, what they're looking for, because it is different for everybody. Um, it's normally it's people that, yeah, they're already there. There's that it's already working in them. Those questions, their desire to know. And when I see, for example, I uh, have somebody where she always felt a connection to the Mexican culture and she did not grow up with her biological father. So she wasn't sure whether she was actually Mexican, but she always felt that connection and very, and then she finds out that she is just to be able to give a person that confirmation. I've had people come to me and say, I'm drawn to this person that lived hundreds of years ago. I feel like I'm connected to them somehow, but I don't know how. And for whatever reason, so far, I've been able to find connection, <laughs> you know, somehow I'm, and I, I'm able to say, well, this is how you're connected. It's just wow. fun, giving those people those confirmation of that corazonadas that they've always had. So coming to me, it gives you answers. It gives you answer, gives you truths. Truths that may be hard to hear, truths that you're, but it's the truth. And I think it's that connection to an ancestor, connection to the culture, connection to that country, um, knowing that you belong, you mm -hmm. are part of that history. You're part of that, or that, those, that, those people, those are your people. 
Right. And and I love that you can confirm a knowing in us because we have a knowing, like mm -hmm. you said, that yearning, that por qué, por qué, and then you can confirm that and how validating. And what we can do with that is let ourselves go grieve it. Probably you probably have, mm -hmm. this is a question. How many times are you like, wow, they, you know, you need to hold space for this, the, your client's grief, your client's excitement, your client's like, they're probably just being hit with so many downloads. Let me know a little bit about what you've kind of what so, you, what you get when you give them their news. Yeah. How does that look? Oh, wow. That usually very emotional. Very emotional. Um, it, I, I'm, and most of the time I end up crying with them. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> because I know I've been, I know, I know what they're feeling. I, I've been there. And to see that it's watching that bond forming. I mean, I'm literally watching that bond, that connection that is forming in front of my eyes. And that's what I'm watching. That's all those emotions that are going through and to hold that space for them, make them feel safe to do that with me. There's no words for that. There's just, it, you know, it's, there's no words. And I mean, most of the time, sometimes I don't find easy things to, to communicate or there's things that I've had to say, you know, there might have been some type of trauma or something. And, and, to know that they have chosen me to hold that information and to be the one to be able to provide them that information and feel safe in that way is there's no words to describe. And I'm, it's, it's an, an honor. honor. I mean, I can't, it's just an honor. I'm just thinking, this is why I love conversations with you because we just make space for the bigness of this conversation. And just exactly. in hearing you, um, I was thinking, why it's so important that you took this leap from HR. It's not just that you're a genealogist, but it matters. Mm -hmm. Imagine me as a first gen Latina wanting to even consider genealogy. First of all, I was like, who does that? But then I find someone like you. And if the documents are in Spanish, we got it. If they're in English, we got it. And you, exactly. you know, it's such a delicate dance in Latinidad. I mean, I'm it sure is. you have to deliver some really, you know, especially for, people of, you know, um, family members that had enslaved histories, right? Like that, or, you know, much of Afro Latino history, Caribbean history has colonialism. I don't know one Island that wouldn't or whatever. So you're delivering mm -hmm. this news, but to have someone like you that can do that delicate dance that understands the, the secrecies that might be, but also to have you be like, you know, um, I understand why your family might have had to run or leave or this, you know, not to shame yeah. them. Whereas I'm sorry if it was like a European genealogist doing it, maybe they would just be giving you the history. But I feel with you, it is that cocoon. It is that community hug from Abuela in the delivery. It's not just like, here you go. So, no. you know, I, you're divine. You're divine. I'm so happy that you're doing this work, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I th again, there's no words to describe how it feels to be able to, to, to have the honor to, to see how many people are coming and trusting me, you know, and some people, you know, they come to me, they talk to me and I, they're so excited. And sometimes they're, they get so, it's hard. They will actually be like, not, oh, maybe not right now, but you know, I just say that when the time is right, you will know I'm here. Yeah. Um, because it is, yeah, it's not just about collecting names. A lot, you know, it's funny because when I first went into this a long time ago, I went into it the, the, the academic way, right? you know, right. let me see how far I can go. <laughs> yeah. The I want to know more about Abuela, but let me see yeah. it. But when I, the, no, there's more to it. I, and I think especially for us that are living here in the U S that are yearning for that sense of connection to our ancestral stories, to know about our own history, to be like, oh, well, no, I only know about my parents and my grandparents. I don't even know what town they come from, you know, and back in the, in the, in the, in the old country. I don't know. Yeah. And to be able to say, to give someone, I think that's so important for us to just, to be able to know our history, to be able to know why things happened the way they happened and to hold space for our ancestors, it shows us, it teaches us grace for ourselves mm. and to have grace for our family. I mean, what I, 
grew to understand so much about my own dad so much by just looking into his paternal side, seeing the, the, you know, the things, the family, the, the dynamics and some of the patterns <laughs> that yeah. you could see just through the documents so much made sense. Yeah. I, I think what, what I feel when you're talking is, in discovering our history, descubriendo tu historia, right? Descubre tu mm -hmm. historia, like your IG. I get it. Um, we get to find that our stories matter. And that is healing because if our stories matter, I matter. Where I yes. came from matters. Where yes. I'm going matters. I matter. Because sometimes I feel like as people who are detached from a land, um, even if it's not me, I was born here, but my mom was detached from a land. She was like you uprooted. And so I am, I am feeling that, but I didn't think that mattered because it wasn't my story, but it absolutely matters. Thank and you. it matters in my healing. I wanted to, um, we had a conversation and, and it was such a beautiful conversation. I remember I was like in my car, I couldn't stop talking, but I really want to, really share a little bit about how our work overlaps. And I yeah. wouldn't have even thought our work overlapped. But when I saw you on the IG live, I'm like, I don't know, you know, I was like, oh my, I had goosebumps. I reached out and I was like, I need to talk to you about epigenetics. And you're like, oh, okay. And so we had a call. And so kind of what you're saying, it, it, it absolutely matters. Um, I talked to you about my abuelo. The story goes that he was a bracero. And I kept hearing he was a bracero in Oxnard. I know we have a history in Oxnard, California, doing capesino work, um, yep. grapes. We also have a history as women in the canneries. So my mom, my grandma and my, my mother worked in the canneries, which is a big history of U.S. Um, uh, like agricultural stuff. But then my mm -hmm. cousin started digging and she's like, you know what? I don't find Abuelo's name anywhere. I don't think he was a bracero. But it was kind of like this, why would he lie? Why was he lying? And I was like, what is he, what is not being told here? So it reached, um, after your conversation, I reached out to my mom and I like met her in a vulnerable, like, hey, let's talk about it. Yeah. And you know, wide-eyed me, um, and, and I'm embarrassed because like Cynthia from the US with this big wide-eyed vision of what my mother's immigration story must look like. I pictured her in the seventies when she said she came like 68. She came over her and her five, six siblings. They came over in Pan Am jets, right? Like she was wearing the top. No, she wasn't. I pictured her coming over like first class, right? Like hoo, 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 hoo. like everybody else in these sixties, like what did you eat in your, in your, in your plane ride? And so I started asking these questions like, hey, I heard that Abuelito wasn't a Brasil. Well, she tells me that my grandfather, um, his dad died when he was nine. And so his mom remarried this man who was abusive to him. He would hit him and his brother and his mom. And so he had to work. He had to carry comida in la cabeza and sell it. And if he didn't sell it, he would get beat. So after a while, he got sick of doing this at 13. You know, we come from Yucatan. So he was on the beaches of Progreso y se fue. He told his mom, one day I'm going to leave y nunca me vas a ver because until you leave that man. And he did it. He snuck wow. on a boat and the boat went to Texas. He didn't know where it would go. But when they all land, I guess the story goes that they found him as a stowaway. And he learned his crafts. He learned how to build a house. He, they just like kept him there because they're like, you know, it's it's 1955. Like, right. Um, and so he just like started learning all these crafts. And then he came back two years later. But some of the pieces we had talked about is like his mom, my abuela, my, I guess my great abuela, she would go to the beach every day llorando, esperando that my abuelito Mario would come home. Mario, donde estás crying, you know, um, by the beach. And one day he did come back and my grandmother left the guy and he's like, look, I'm going to take us to America. I'm going to show us how to build a life. Like I, I know people, I know things. So anyway, the story goes to that. And then he ended up marrying my grandmother. And so he got everybody papers there by working, by, you know, by, by the stuff. But I, I really thought about this feeling I have with the water. Mm -hmm. When I watched Moana, I was in this postpartum funk, but my baby loved it. Okay. Moana is about like being the, the call, you know, she's called to the water. And I was like, 
why am I crying? You know, but something about the water, the ocean, um, even to this day, like everyone's like yoga and I'm like swimming laps is my yoga. Like I can cry in the water. I can sing in the water. You can't hear it. It it goes everything. So now I really see this connection with how my grandfather was on the water doing boats. You know, we live in a, in a port town. Um, and my grandmother's so many stories are of my grandmother's crying at the, at the beach, like, you know, and this longing, and it really started to connect this longing within me. So I wanted to really share how, how you see this story and like, how genealogy impacts that, but also the epigenetics. Like once I started realizing that it did matter how they got here, the history of their story, I can give my family compassion. And it's not that my grandfather lied or anything. It's just that it was complicated. And back then Mm -hmm. papers were different. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my, I think right now the most recent thing I'm realizing. So a lot of our countries, we descend from Canary Island immigrants people that migrated from the Canary mm-hmm. Islands. So a lot of the Canary, I- so they, that was, you know, the Canary Islands is off the coast of Northwest of Northwest Africa. And, but it was colonized by Spain before um, Puerto Rico and, you know, before over here. <laughs> and basically they were the guinea pig of what eventually okay. happened here. And this longing for home. And it's this longing. I mean, and I think, Every single one of us that feel it, that want that, that, that longing for the ancestral country, the Puerto Ricanos like me that leave and God, I can't talk about it. (laughs) That longing for home and wanting to find a way to go home. Where, so I'm hearing um, I'm ta- I'm I'm right right reading about the Canary Island uh, ancestors, and there's this poem from an immigrant from the Canary Islands when he migrated to Puerto Rico, and it was it's us. Hmm. I mean, he wrote this I think in late 1700s, 1800s and when the still- first migration started, and I'm like, there's an actual statue in in one of the canary islands of a migrant ancestor with a hole in the chest i'm like i and now and now i'm looking at my dna seeing how i'm like oh my that i have canary island ancestors Mm, wow i i do have them and i actually um this genealogical society in Puerto Rico did this amazing project because I mean, even our accents, I mean, Puerto Rico is so prominent. Even our accents are very similar. I've heard to Canary Island, um, native people that live there, but the Canary Islands also had their own natives, the guanches. Okay. Okay. So a lot, some of our, even our words that we use like guagua, that's a guanche word. And there, so that's where my genetics so I must. Uh, so is Canary Island, because I know about the Taino people. So yep. are the Taino and the Canary Island are they the same, or did they Different. did they did they come together and create Boricua? No. So the, what happened was the the Canary Islands, the the natives of the Canary Islands come from are ethnically African. They come yeah. from Northwest Africa, um, and they were there, and then Spain came, you know, colonized. And eventually mixed with the natives as it happened. And then eventually when my, when the, they started the Canary Island peoples, one, hundreds of years after started to migrate to Puerto Rico Got and you. to the Dominican Republic, to Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia. Um, I think Dominican Republic though is one of the islands that had a lot of migration from the Canary Islands. So, um, but to hear that they were a peoples that were forced to leave their island because of what was happening over there. They, mm. a lot of them left because they had to leave, not because they, and they left with the purpose of wanting to go back. And many of them didn't, obviously, because many of us exist now with their, <laughs> with their genetics. So, and a lot of us from Puerto Rico probably descend from them, those, those ancestors also. So just to, Re- making sense of that longing for home and how I connect. Mm. It was like, 
that's that's where it comes from. Those ancestors that left there wanting to go back and never went back because many of them never went back. And what do you do if you're like longing for a home that you're not going to go to? You don't know if, if, or when, and it's like, what, what word always comes to mind is restlessness. And I appreciate your, your candid, your vulnerability, your generosity to, because we're talking about big stuff, but when I started to accept, cause I can feel it in your voice and I see you, I know you're a mom and I see you as, oh my gosh, you were like my mom, mm-hmm. that you're a mom, but you're a, you're a person. And to hear your story is like, I, I can only imagine now you have a home that is your child's home. And it's like, great, <laughs> they have this home, but my home is over there and now their home. And it's all these, these hearts. And yes, growing up, yeah. my mom was always sad living in California and I, and she knew English and she had like a good job and we lived in a good house. And it's like, how come you can't be present with me? And it's this restlessness. And I call it just this like tornado of like, I don't know what I'm doing. I just, and it's, and I really see her now because of this epigenetic findings and like knowing where she, the land that they, how they had to come here. She was a mother in this country, but missed her home, missed her mom, missed her tierra. And I know it now because when I go back to Yucatan, I miss it. I miss it. On a good day, I'm like, oh, you know where I'd like to be? And it's, I was like, mom, how is it that I'm born here? But that, la playa, like that is my playa now. You know, every time I'm back, Isneri, it feels like I'm back for a new reason and, and my, and my país knows why. And it has what I need. Yep. What is that? Right? Like, I know. It knows exactly what I need to find. It, 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 it gives me exactly the kind of experiences I need. And I never realized that. And I've gone like 10, 15. I went one time 15 as a teenager on my own, right? And we, we were like teenagers. So we were like looking into Mayan ruins at night and like really, you know, then at 20, then after some miscarriages as a muhead. And like each time I've like learned something new from this land. What do you think yeah. it is? I know you do genealogy, but what is it with the land and our story? Like you're talking about people, but can right. you tell us a little bit about the connection you find with land and Oh history? my God. Yeah. So for me in Puerto Rico, that was another thing that I instinctively, because there's not a day that I don't, I wasn't like that for me. Mm. There was this connection to the land where as a child, I instinctively, I mean, I'm known for the one que siempre está descalza. Like I never wear shoes. I'm always barefoot because I needed to just knowing to feel that land underneath my feet. There was a comfort there that I couldn't explain. I didn't know where it came from. And then finding out later on through genealogy, more about my Taino ancestors, knowing more about the Taino people. It was like a puzzle piece click. I know where it comes from. My love for, for stories, the oral history, never yeah. understood. Knowing now that it also comes from that. But yeah, that, that connection to the land, I mean, in Puerto, I don't, and I never could explain why. That is just, as long as I know I'm there, I don't care where you put me. Oh, I love, as long as you know I'm there, I don't care where you put me. I love it. And you know, for people who don't know, and it makes me like, ah, um, Puerto Rico has a huge history of colonization. It is a territory. Mm -hmm. Um, There's so many things people don't know. Like people who come from Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens. This is a territory of the United States, but it's, it's even that is even there's duality in that, right? There's different things, but the colonization of it, well, that's a big colonization. part of it, right? Right. That's a whole nother, we could do, we could do, we could do series, but I just think like how many voices have tried to speak for Puerto Rico and how great that you are, you're speaking for it in your own way. And like yeah. how, how you, I could see like you and I would be cool friends, like hanging out outside and sorry. And how we used to be seen as like, you know, maybe chatty Cathy's and look how it's paying off. You know, we really value this connection. I love that. It's so beautiful. What, 
what have you felt this work has done for you in reclaiming this this longing for your home of Puerto Rico or this how has this helped you with that that hole in your heart for your land? Mm. <laughs> um it keeps me connected. It keeps me, it makes me feel, okay, I don't have to be in Puerto Rico to do something for Puerto Rico. Wow. Um, do something for my community. And we all have a piece to play in uniting our communities, in bringing, um, in helping in, in the way we can. And this is my piece. Um, it helps me fill that void of not being there yet mm. and not be not finding my way yet there, which I'm still seeking it. <laughs> um, bringing Puerto Rico to my children because, you know, my, my, my son unfortunately went through a lot of health things that kept us away from Puerto Rico for a good 10 years which is the longest I had been without being in the island. And I felt that, oh my God, they don't have, how can I bring that connection to them? And this is my way. And, you know, I, and it's so amazing to see my daughter correcting her teachers about the Tainos. It's like, okay, I'm doing something right. <laughs> or to add more information and to see her, that pride in her. And say to me, mommy, you know, I, I correct it because I'm Taina too. And I'm like, mm. yeah. And it's just, that's, that's what it means to me. That's what it, you know, and I, hopefully one day uh, it will be a regular, you know, I will regularly feel Puerto Rico under my feet again. <laughs> and I hope that, you know, comes soon, but <laughs> I feel you know. like you spread it. You spread it in so many ways for what you can't be like literally rooted in. You're rooted in it in a, in like a very metaphysical spiritual way. And so like you give it and, and then you can still give it in facts. It's so beautiful. And I, I just, I just thank you for, for stepping out of any, you know, like as, as Latinos, I feel like it's really hard for us to follow our dreams to yes. leave something like HR. HR is so professional and so the right move right and you were like right. nah nah and here you are and I'm so happy to have found you and just to, to feel you Thank I you. I know I this is um I created this course epigenetics and variadismo and it's like I go to sleep better at night I don't know I just feel like and I just I get so emotional with you because it's like um I couldn't change all these things for the women in my lineage, but I can do this now and it does represent them. And, and like when I teach people about the word Marianismo and the history, they're like, I didn't even know that, but I know it in me. And I'm like, you know, and so to be able to hold space and conversations, I didn't know how healing it would be for me to keep, to keep practicing it with people. And you, I always hear new stories and new things unlock that, that just really, kind of build our foundation more. So I just yeah. thank you because you, people like you make all of this work collective. You know, I, I get this feeling of like, when I get really scared of like, how do we overcome all of this colonization? Right. And like years of this suffering, it's just so heavy. It's so much. Yes. And then there's people like you. And I think, oh, I'm not supposed to do everything on my own. Like you said, it's your part, but I know yeah. that there's beautiful people doing their parts to hold things up and I can just do my part and then it's a ripple effect. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I know that you do such beautiful work. I know it's like when you, when we first met, you know, like you're like, we're the, like, I think the perfect example of the pieces we each do. I, I always saw the patterns. I always saw, well, yeah, that's why I do that. But what is that? And when you came to me epigenetics and I'm like, Oh, Oh, both. It was like, boom, <laughs> it came together. And it, and that's because of the piece you're doing. Mm. That is so important because I can give information. I give information of maybe, but you, ex you, you give, you make that you help us make that connection as to the why. Yeah. And 
And that's why I think it's, I love how, yeah, we're all kind of coming together. All of us doing our own little thing, our, our pieces are coming together and, and more of us are having these conversations. I mean, this, like I, when I was saying, I, I started working at, at, at the higher ed to get to get to finally get in touch with my community. And little did I know it was the beginning of this journey. When I finally started to stop being intimidated, stop second guessing myself so much, letting go of what happened when I first arrived and saying and being there and doing something for my community from here. And I met amazing mujeres. And then through them, I met my mentor, Denise Soler Cox. Who I, and with her, I just followed instinct. I just, I saw her documentary. I said, I need to see her. I need to, I don't know why, but I need to meet her. Yeah, you told I me met that. her six months later. And then out of completely, because I so not like me, I just, I was in that elevator with her, bringing her to where she was going to speak. And I said to her, this is what I want to do. La, 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 la. And she looked at me and she said, Mujer, you have to do it. We're going to talk later. And I'm like, literally my stomach fell to thy feet. I was like shaking like this. Didn't think anything else would come of it. Stayed in my car talking for hours after. And not only that, we find out that we are cousins. I was so going to say, Maria. Maria. She's you had like this knowing. She's familia. And now, yeah, she's my mentor, but it's like, hey, prima, you know, and it's just this familiarity. But through her, um, I found so many other women like us that, you know, that just are finally saying yes to our dreams, saying yes to ourselves, breaking out of that, the social, what's, you know, you know, the social norms that we are taught through our culture that how we should be or how it's supposed to be of what colonial, colonialism also taught us that we're supposed to be, how we're all shedding that and breaking out of it. And this is what's happening. Yeah. Wow. How beautiful. When you were in the elevator, I almost pictured like little you shouting it. Like, you know, I just got to say this thing because I picture you again, like in the kitchen, <laughs> you know, like, cha -cha 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 -cha. and then you see your hero and you're just like, I got to say this thing. And then look, it worked. Or even maybe that was your just epigenetics knowing, I know this is good. Like just knowing comfort, knowing you could. That's yes. Amazing. Yeah. It's so funny. That's exactly how she tells the story. <laughs> I can see you. I'm like, I can see you just like that. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful, what a beautiful story. And it's really just, uh, kind of another reminder of this grander work. Like you might not know the big picture, but let's get pieces of it together. And this is why I love to talk about the work of epigenetics of like leaning back into that intuition, trusting yourself. Yes. I like to get into this abuela energy. Um, mm -hmm. And the other day I was cooking and I was upset about a bill, like a tax bill that came. Oh gosh, I didn't expect this. Right. And I started to feel myself get into this scarcity mindset, this worry. Cause you know, if I don't have a worry, I'll find one. And so this, this bill found me and I was right. like, oh, but I start to get like extreme. And I know it's from my family. You know, my, my grandmother grew up like my grandma, like, uh, like my, um, aboli or my tia says she grew up you know, on dirt in, in a house, you know, in a palapa, like under a palapa house, really. And so anyway, I get this like fierce scarcity, this fierce fear of yeah. fear that doesn't even fill mine. And so this day I was like, you know what? I need to cook something. I need to cook something. I need to like get, and I don't even consider myself a cook, but here I was like wearing a bata and like just barefoot in the kitchen. And I'm like trying to cook and I just can't get out of my head. And all of a sudden I have this like knowing so I have this salchicha, this kielbasa salchicha, and I start to hear this voice like, okay, here's what you do. By the time I'm done, I have made three dishes with this kielbasa salchicha. And it's like I'm boxing them and something was like, this is how you make things stretch. It was like, it's not about finding the big solution. It was tapping into this like intuitive knowing within me and this like, 
we have survived all of these years. I can teach you these little things. You just have to like look for it. So yeah. I really feel like this piece of like knowing the why and the how and how it got here can help me figure out what to do with this now. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, because that's how I did. On, I don't know what it was. It was like an auto body experience because I mean, it must have ancestors. I mean, I, now I just say those, it was my time and they knew it was my time. And it was like, okay, Edie, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> kind of and, like when you're on the escalator and you're like, am I going to go? And they're like, yep. <laughs> I mean, if when I tell people that before all of this, I used to be, I considered myself antisocial. I considered myself the lone, you know, the lone wolf. Um, I... I considered myself all these things that I know that obviously I wasn't because I wasn't happy feeling like that. It didn't, mm. I was not a happy person feeling like that. And following my instinct, it opened up the eighties I knew before I moved here. I, you know, back in Puerto Rico, I just remember being a, this little outgoing little girl was always everywhere talking to older people here you go uh, always, yeah. dancing because <laughs> I was always dancing um you put me with a good set of drums and there I go and now I know why thanks to my African ancestors and now and I tap and she's back she came back Beautiful. and I'm just embracing little Iris and taking care of her and saying honey it's it's okay Beautiful. I was going to ask you with that. I love to picture her just like, I wanted to ask what is little ideas for <laughs> you? What is your favorite way to honor your ancestors? When do you feel the most connected? What are you doing when you're like, oh, she's caught up in it. Is it the, the dancing? Like the dancing. You just need a day. Okay. The music, the dancing, the drums. That is one of my ultimate favorite ways to, to go outside, feel the breeze. That's one of my other favorite ways to do. I love to go to the ocean. So I get it, La Playa, the ocean. So I'll literally drive an hour and a half just to stand on the coast because I live an hour and a half from the nearest beach. So yeah, I'll drive and I'll just sit there. I'll just stand there. And that's all the, one of the other ways that I just love to connect and feel them and just... But yeah, music a bit, music has definitely music been, is, since I was a little girl, it beautiful. gets me going. <laughs> yeah, I could see them just like, yeah. And then my last one is, how do you want to be remembered as an ancestor? I know you're a living ancestor right now. You're doing the work. But you know, one day in a long, long, many, many years, you know, you're going to have an altar where your family's going to say stories about you. And like, how do you want them to honor you? What might be on your altar? What do you want? What kind of what kind of memories do you want to say about you as a living ancestor? Okay, first thing the word that comes to mind is love, loving, um, storyteller, hold or the, or the holder of the stories. I want to leave a legacy of knowledge of our history, knowledge of our people, appreciation for our people. I want my grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know about the beautiful island they come from, even if, and maybe hopefully some of them will be able to live there, like be there, live out their lives there. Um, I, you know, just an appreciation for themselves. A follow your dream. I want them to know, my God, follow your dream. Do what makes you happy. You don't have to follow a book of rules. And I think that I think that's what it is because I broke through all of that, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want to show. I want. I, I was teaching that to my daughter, but I wasn't practicing it. I'm like, I'm telling her to do it, but look at me, and she's watching a mother every day coming home exhausted miserable about what she's doing and falling asleep because she's exhausted. 
And now she watches a mom that loves and adores what she does. And she, and she just glows when she looks at me and that, but I, I want her to learn that for herself. I want her kids. I want my, my descendants to be free, free of all of those chains. That's beautiful. Thank you. And you know, you, of course you, you had to say free at the end. I three times in this thing have wrote the word freedom. You said at the beginning, when you think of Puerto Rico, you think of freedom. And that's what you thought of as a little girl. But the freedom kept coming in. You know, when you give people the truth about their their lineage, you're giving people freedom from any kind of misconceptions, from shackles, from stories that were told by a, from a colonized lens, from yes. stories that were told through judgment or shame. You're giving them freedom. And even if it is something disappointing, something they weren't looking forward to, you're giving them the freedom to now make a path for their themselves. Yes. Yes. You are a freedom. Like you really, you really write for freedom. You really like hold space for that. And you're doing it in real time right now. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful. You're welcome. You're yeah. welcome. Oh, these conversations are huge. I <laughs> I have felt so heavy and light. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I know. I know you know. I know you know. It's like <laughs> demasiado pesado, pero también like <gasps> it's so right. So thank you so much for your time, your abuelita medicine, your energy. And I just, I wanted to ask, where can people find you? How can they reach out to you for consultation or to see more of your amazing videos? Let us know. Absolutely. So everybody, you can find me on Instagram at Decure Tu Historia. Um, Facebook, I also have a platform on Facebook. I'm on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn, but I think the two main ones are definitely Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can, I have my website, uh, I will, <laughs> um, you can book me for, I do offer a free 30 minute consultation in case for anything, any questions you have, or if you want my help, that's the time to catch me, talk to me. And I, you know, uh, what else? There's my email newsletter that you can join through my website. That's another way to keep in touch with me. And yeah, and I'm constantly live and giving, I always try to give as much information as I can. I find it, I try, especially for those that want to do the research themselves. Um, because that's the other part of my mission is that I found was that none of us, a lot of us are not aware of what's out there. Mm. Of all or even the how to do it. And exactly, or how to do it and that it is out there and how many amazing Latino genealogists are out there trying so hard to preserve our history. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that they're out there. We don't know they're there. We don't know that they exist. And so I feel like I'm that, also that voice of letting people know, here, go here. <laughs> Wait, he's doing that. Go over there. <laughs> oh, you remind <laughs> me of like, um, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Harriet the Spy. Did you ever see that movie as a kid? I know. <laughs> you remind me of like Latina Harriet the Spy, like something for us, like, you know, you're going to gather it. If something's going on, you're going to tell us about it for our cultura. <laughs> so thank you so much for just your generosity of spirit, for being here with us and sharing so much of your heart and story with thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>